We would like to welcome everyone to another edition of our Orthodox uh, Bible Study Program. We apologize for the lateness in starting because we had some technical difficulties, but thank God we were able to wor uh, work them out. Uh, today, uh, we are uh, in the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation. Those of you who are following by way of the Orthodox Study Bible, both Old and New Testaments, we're on page 1739, 1739. Those of you who may be following by another translation, another text, we're in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, beginning at chapter 18, verse 1. Uh, let us uh, continue, uh, but first we will offer the prayer for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and to those in the tombs bestowing life. O Master who loves mankind, illumine our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your gospel. Instill in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life, and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to you we give glory, together with your eternal Father, your all-holy, gracious, and light-creating Spirit, now and ever and unto ages of ages. Amen. Christ is risen. Indeed, he is risen. We were talking about the fallen Babylon. And just to kind of give you a recap because of the time element uh, between the classes, uh, we were talking about the uh, uh, worst period in the history of Israel, the Babylonian captivity, in which uh, Israel was conquered. Uh, the temple is destroyed, and the people of Israel are carried, carried off, off uh, into, uh, into captivity, captivity to Babylon, Babylon a, foreign a foreign country, a foreign land. land. Uh, a very strange place, uh, different customs, different tongue, completely different tongue, a complete alienation. And um, as a result, um, because of the arrogance of the king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, and uh, others, um, uh, as, as, as in the past, but with the uh, emergence of Nebuchadnezzar and his arrogance, uh, highlighting to the point where the golden statue is, I mean, the statue is erected, and the people throughout the entire land were ordered at the sound of the musical instruments to bow down and to worship this image. And the audacity of uh, the, the assumption of the king uh, of his divinity and in, and his self-importance uh, and his grandeur and, and all of these sins that are associated with it. Uh, so that in this symbol of Babylon is, is a complete manifestation of evil uh, and wantonness and sin from every possible aspect. And of course what is happening is that uh, this uh, same type of understanding from uh, the prophecy of Daniel and others in the Old Testament uh, is being now uh, placed into the symbolism of Rome. Now Rome has taken that place and her emperors are assuming divine names and prerogatives that belong only to God. And not only uh, was there a corruption of the emperor and the government, but also society itself. Uh, in uh, the, um, uh, even going into the businesses uh, where people were being cheated out of goods and there was dishonesty in the marketplace and uh, a complete depravity of, of moral order. Uh, almost uh, like Babylon and, and like Sodom and Gomorrah. And the people of uh, this uh, era, those who are faithful to the Lamb, uh, although there was corruption in the world, we saw a glimpse in the heavenly reality where, where uh, there is liturgy, there is the praising of God, the calling of, 
of God to act and the, uh, the, the sanctity and holiness uh, just kind of compared to the complete opposite to the depravity that exists on earth. In fact, in one particular section, the people were told to flee. Uh, just like uh, Lot and his family were told to flee from uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, they are called upon to even flee, even not only just literally to flee from the city, to uh, escape the perversion so that we do not become corrupted by it, but also to be understand, in, understood in a, in a uh, symbolic way of fleeing from evil. In fact, even the prophet himself, uh, uh, John is taken to a desert place. Uh, a lot of times this desert place was a place of evil and temptation and so forth. But yet at uh, other times it was a place of prayer, it was a place of solitude. Uh, where our Lord even went into the wilderness to be able to be alone and to be able to pray. Uh, and uh, to be able to flee from the influence, not only directly from the evil, that was being perpetrated uh, by Rome, uh, but also uh, uh, by this uh, golden cup and the, the, the polluted wine, uh, the luring and the tempting of other people to believe this and, and to participate in, in this perversion. In fact, uh, our Lord warns us in the Gospel uh, of uh, the perverting of uh, the little ones. Uh, it would be better if a millstone was tied around our neck and it was thrown into the sea uh, than to cause harm uh, to the little ones, to lose faith or to be perverse, to be taught to be perverse. Uh, and also uh, we have an understanding here that uh, uh, this same type of thing is taking place, to flee from it. Uh, and, and even in our day and age, to be able to remain pure, to turn away from the evil that is so prevalent and, and, and uh, this evil that is being portrayed as being very seductive, very luring. And uh, what happens is it leads to uh, perversion and it leads to destruction. Uh, and uh, just as uh, uh, this evil was ascending from the pit, uh, it will descend, it will be destroyed, that Rome will be destroyed as well as the other kings or the others who were influenced uh, by the perversion that was brought about by Rome. And now in chapter 18 we come to the actual judgment uh, of the city of uh, Babylon or Rome and by extension uh, the empire that was corrupted. Uh, you know Rome being the capital was kind of like the pivotal point where this corruption was taking place and it was infiltrated into the entire world to all different aspects of, of society and, and, and various succeeding emperors and rulers and so forth and nations that participated in this evil. It says in chapter 18, beginning at verse 1, that after these things I saw another angel coming down from heaven having great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his glory. It's interesting to be able to point out that this angel coming down from heaven, coming down from the very presence of God, had this illuminating countenance, uh, this grace and, and, and uh, this light, if you will, that is uh, often referred to as an aspect of God, uh, is now being reflected in this angelic being. And uh, this calls to remembrance uh, Moses himself, who was, uh, was told by God to ascend uh, Mount Sinai, to come into his presence, into this dark cloud. Although it was a dark cloud, it was filled with the bright, uh, the brightness of the glory of God. And it's, the scripture tells us that when Moses came down from the mountain, that uh, from being in contact with that which was holy and sacred, the, the light of God, that his face was so bright that it had to be veiled. The people of Israel could not look upon the face of Moses without squinting, without being troubled, without even uh, some type of physical pain as a result of, 
of this, uh, this divine glory and light. And he cried mightily with a loud voice, saying, Babylon the great hearted, uh, the Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit, and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Uh, this fallenness uh, is indicative of uh, the prophecies of uh, Isaiah uh, and other prophets that uh, talked about uh, the uh, judgment that was to come upon this nation that was perverting the people of God. And it talked about the, and predicted the total destruction uh, of uh, these emperors and these, uh, these empires, these enemies of God, these direct enemies of God. In fact, in the Old Testament, uh, Nebuchadnezzar began to fall, and uh, the empire that he created began to fall. In fact, in one particular section of the prophetic literature, that God even humbles him to eat grass like an animal, you see. And as a result, uh, as uh, the uh, Babylonian king begins to fall, uh, what happens is uh, that a new king is uh, being raised by God in the person of Cyrus, the Persian king, who will come and now at this particular time uh, in prophetic literature, what happens is that, that uh, although at the beginning uh, the uh, Babylonians were sent to bring judgment and punishment upon Israel for her sins. Now, uh, what happens is that in that capacity, uh, they become overly vicious. Uh, they become overly cruel, uh, cruel and out of control. And as a result, they fall under God's judgment. And they also will, uh, will fall, as well as uh, all of the enemies of God's people. And, and to the point where now Rome is a haven of demons. In fact, if we were to read Pauline theology, we would see that even in Paul's understanding, that as these people are worshiping these pagan idols, they are actually worshiping devils themselves, demons themselves, uh, which is a complete uh, perversion. And uh, it says that, uh, that the uh, nation of Rome, the Roman uh, Empire, uh, will fall. Uh, it is being judged. Uh, it is now become the total enemy of God. It is the antithesis of the good that is being done in the community of the church, as it is in, uh, in, in heaven. And as a result, there is a foul smell there is a stench from the, the decadence of the sin that is so much a part of Rome. We continue on by saying, For her sins have reached to heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works. In the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for her. Uh, this uh, is God's people are called upon to come out of her and not be able to partake of the punishment that is going to be given to Rome and the destruction and the devastation that is a part of it. To be separated from the world uh, in a spiritual manner and to be able to uh, leave the darkness of the powers of evil and uh, to uh, be able to uh, uh, come to God and be a part of those who are being saved through the preaching of the gospel in the community of the church. And this will be a double punishment, uh, and she will be repaid uh, more so for the evil and the horror that she has inflicted upon uh, the believers. In the measure that she glorified herself and lived luxuriously, and in the same measure give her torment and sorrow, for she says in her heart, I sit as queen, I am no widow, and will not see sorrow. Therefore her plagues will come in one day, 
death and mourning and famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. You see? There will be a day of reckoning, and there will be this purging and destruction of fire. Uh, in the ancient world, whenever the metal and the impurities of the metal, uh, they, they wanted to be able to get out that impurity, they would heat it hot, and the impur impurities would, would, would come out of the metal. The same type of thing is being done at this particular time. Uh, that this sin and this decadence is, is now being judged by God, so that it will, uh, will, will leave and, and will not be a, a part, uh, and will be judged by God. And we see the utter arrogance of, of Rome, that she sees herself as a queen enthroned among the nations, okay? And she thinks that uh, she will not become a widow, uh, that somehow judgment will, will uh, escape her because she's so powerful and mighty, even more powerful than God Himself. Uh, this is the ultimate extent of the perversion of evil and sin that is within us. Many times when we sin, the temptation that the evil one gives to us that somehow God doesn't care or we will not be held accountable, or for what the things that we do in the darkness uh, that God will not see, you see. In fact, even in the Gospel itself, uh, in the Matthew, the Lord tells us that uh, what is done in darkness will be exposed in the light. What is hidden will be exposed. Uh, what is silently said in the streets will be shouted from the rooftop, you see. Uh, the, uh, the, the one effect that sin has in our life is that it numbs us. It numbs us to think that we will escape judgment, that we will not be found out, you see, and we will not be held responsible. Uh, and as a result, it leads to our own self-arrogance. And as a result, there will become plagues that will come, death and mourning and famine. And utterly, fire will not only uh, purify, but it will also destroy. For the reassurance is given that the Lord is strong, He is powerful. St. Paul said in one of his epistles, he says, when sin abounds, God's grace abounds even more. See, he says that in a sense of hope, but yet in this context, it is said in a sense of certain judgment. God, God will see. He does see all things, and He will judge. Let's continue on forward. It says, the kings of the earth who committed fornication and lived luxuriously with her will weep and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning standing at a distance for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, the great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour your judgment has come. You see, the kings of the earth are the ones who went and committed fornication with this adulterous city. And they will mourn. And although it is from a distance, they will, uh, they will mourn. And they will, be, they will be overwhelmed when they see the judgment that comes on Rome. Uh, the just judgment of God that will be placed on Rome. And that judgment will be a, a specter for the entire world to see. You see? Not only her in her idolatrous state, in her pagan worship, and the idolatry that comes from it, but also in regards to uh, the society itself, uh, and the pollution that, that enters into society, the corruption, the injustice that is inflicted on other people, uh, from the marketplace to the courts, you see. And as a result, these kings will, will shudder to see what has happened. Uh, they will be devastated, 
because they will be able to see the same judgment that was rendered against Sodom and Gomorrah in the days of old will now be visited upon Rome. And there will be the destruction. There will be a complete collapse. There will be a complete loss of revenue. And all of the luxury that Rome enjoyed. And you have to, re you have to be able to understand that this luxury of which we are talking about it is, it is a luxury, uh, a wealth, a prestige that was enjoyed by the affluent at the expense of the poor. And not only was it no concern for taking care of the needs of the poor, but they also exploited the poor, you see. Uh, and this also was a very important part of Old Testament prophetic literature. And we see that it is a part of the judgment that is inflicted upon Babylon here in the book of Revelation. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, for no one buys her merchandise anymore. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and incense, fragrant oil, and frankincense, wine, and oil, flying flour, and wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, chariots, and bodies and souls of men. You see? You see the expanse of the extravagance of her luxury? Anything that the world would hold in esteem and value was a part of the corruption of Rome, and that will be destroyed. Uh, there will be no silver, there will be no gold, uh, there will be no earthly possessions. In fact, at every funeral service in the Orthodox Church, through the hymns of St. John Damascene, we are warned over and over again, that with death, all of these things will be destroyed. It will mean nothing. There will be no value. The only thing of value that will, ex will exist is our faith in our good works, you see, that will stand before God. So we have a listing of all the different luxuries, not only all the different luxuries of the wealthy and elegant, the affluent, and, 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 and the luxury that is a part of it, but also the bronze, the iron, the marble, uh, the, the, the military weapons and, and, and anything that is associated with worldly power will be judged and will be destroyed. The fruit of your soul longed for, the fruit of your soul longed for and has gone from you and all the things which are rich and splendid have gone from you and you shall find them no more at all. The merchants of these things who became rich by her will stand at a distance for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, the great city has been clothed in fine purple and, and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour such great riches came to nothing. Every shipmaster, all who traveled by ship sailors, and as many as trade on the sea stood at a distance and cried out when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, What is like this great city? They threw dust on their heads and cried out, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, the great city in which all who had ships on the sea became rich by her wealth, for in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God has, has avenged you on her. You see? All of these political leaders and these economic wealthy people are now devastated, these merchants. And as a result, uh, there is devastation upon her. However, heaven rejoices. And the ones who are being saved, the apostles, the saints, the prophets, are now rejoicing 
over this particular site because justice is being rendered. And now the just judgment, and this is now being visited upon Rome, this fallen Babylon, and will be utterly destroyed. Verse 21, then it says, And mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence and great, the great city Babylon shall be thrown down and shall not be found any more. The sounds of harpists, musicians, flutes, and trumpeters shall not be heard in you anymore. You see, music which was the ultimate sign of rejoicing and dancing and joy that they once heard and they once participated in to the extreme is now going to be taken away, you see. There will be no more uh, music. Uh, there will be no more joy. There will be no more merriment. And this is in contrast to the life that they once lived. The light of a lamp shall not shine in you anymore, and the voice of the bridegroom and bride shall not be heard in you anymore. For your merchants were the great men of the earth, for by your sorcery all the nations are deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and saints, and all who were slain upon the earth. You see, now it can be seen plainly and clearly the effects of the sins committed and the atrocities committed by the great harlot Babylon, that is Rome. And it is now being exposed. Even the blood itself can be seen, the blood that was shed by the prophets and the saints. And all who were slain uh, upon the earth. The judgments of God are now righteousness compared to the slaughter of uh, the uh, brethren, the persecuted Christians. And as a result, this judgment uh, is reaped upon the city of Rome and its inhabitants. And as a result, it is destroyed. And as a result, uh, there they shall be slain. Let's go into chapter 19. After these things, the scripture says, I heard again this loud voice. You see, this triumphant voice, this loud voice of power and authority. The voice of a great multitude of heaven saying, Alleluia. You see? As the devastation on earth is happening, the heavens are rejoicing. They are singing the praises of God, the Alleluia, the hymn of praise. Salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord. This is the new song that is being sung by the heavens and by the multitude of the church, those who are being saved. It true belong, a true honor and glory belongs to God, who is Lord, you see. Uh, and true and righteous are his judgments, because he has judged the great hearted who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her, you see, by her own hands and the atrocities that she has inflicted, she now will be judged. You know, in the Gospel, our Lord said something very significant to the prophets, uh, uh, rather to the apostles. He says, you must remember, the same judgment that you have used to judge others is the same judgment that will be judged upon you. You see? And that is true justice. It is not severity, it is not being over uh, harsh, but it is God who is being just, who is being righteous, who is now being praised by the saints of heaven. And after the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, 
who sat on the throne saying, Amen, let it be so, that's what Amen means, and Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you His servants, and those who fear Him both small and great. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thunder saying, Alleluia, over and over again this canticle was being sung. This thunderous voice, this almighty power, this over-encompassing greatness of God, this glory of God that is now being praised. In fact, the voice came from the throne saying that God is to now to be praised for that which has happened, the judgment that has been rendered, the justice that has been restored. Okay? It is only proper that God be praised. And even in our day and age, it is only proper that we come to His home and praise and glorify Him and to offer hymns of thanksgiving. In fact, of the, in, in the prophetic literature of the Old Testament, in the Psalms, uh, in the hymns of the suffering servant of Isaiah, the suffering servant will in the future be vindicated by God. And for the suffering and, and, and the, the, the death and the suffering that is a part of it, he will be vindicated. And through that, God will be glorified. And there will be a new people created. And they will sing a new song of praise. A new song of glorification. A new song of thanksgiving to God. Okay? And the evil that was a part will now make up for the suffering that the servant had to endure. The suffering that ultimately will bring salvation for those who seek God. Both small and great. We continue on and it says, and, as, and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many waters, Alleluia. It says that at the Passover, the deliverance of Egypt, and the new Passover from Babylon, that there will be united a, a, a Israel, a church of God, a people of God who are dedicated to the Lord. And as a result, there is this symbolism of a marriage, which is the symbol of the ultimate union between God and His people. Just as in the sacrament of marriage, we take place the, the, the ultimate union and the sacredness of that union between man and woman. That was used in, from the times of the apostles as a re way of referring to this ultimate union that will be taken place by God in the fullness of that kingdom. See? In the Old Testament, you had the, the, uh, the uh, uh, germ, or you had the beginning of this in, in the theology of covenant, a covenant of a divine relationship between God and Israel that God will be their God and people, uh, that Israel will be His people, that they would keep fast and hold fast His, his commandments. All right? Uh, we, we see this even in the sense of the Eucharist, where we are united as a people of God through the blood of God and through the body and blood of God, and we are united in him, with Him in an intimate sacramental way. And now we see here in the symbolism of 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 marriage itself as a type of covenant, a marriage as a type of Eucharistic oneness that is now being shared and is now being enjoyed in the fullness of God's kingdom that uh, is, uh, is to come. Uh, the bridegroom has come and he is now united to the bride and they are at home in the bridal chamber. And now they are going to be called upon to enjoy the bridal supper. You see? The charge is now betrothed to the Lord. And it is betrothed by her fidelity, uh, by her faith, and the living of the faith. 
and she now eagerly anticipates and longs for the coming of the bridegroom uh, in the uh, marriage supper that will be eaten in the fullness of the kingdom. Okay. Uh, I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, the sound of many wonders. Let us be glad, the scripture says, and let us rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. You see? Didn't we just sing and utilize this hymnography in the Paschal celebration of the church? Okay? Uh, that we should rejoice and give glory to him, uh, for the Lord has come. Uh, Christ is risen. It says in verse 8, And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, in contrast to the riches and the wealth and the, the arraignment of the affluent of the fallen Babylon, now the church is decked out in all of its beauty. You see, just like a bride at the wedding is beautiful. There's a new hairdo, there's makeup, there's a beautiful gown that she is presented to the bride. You see, all of these beautiful symbolisms uh, that are a part of it. And now this marriage feast is taking place. The bride is being made ready. She now is vested in true fine linen. She is clean, she is bright. And uh, it is uh, seen in the righteousness of the saints. And he said to me, write, and you know, whenever God calls upon someone to write, it's important to write it down because it is important to remember. And it also acts as a testimony to the reality of the truth that is being shown and being recorded. Write this. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That is our ultimate joy. That is our ultimate uh, expectation. That is the reason why we live. That is the reason why we have faith to be able to be called to this marriage supper of the Lamb. And as he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. You see, you heard in Babylon the lies, the false beliefs, the heresies, the false preaching, the false teachers, you see. But this is now the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Do you see? The testimony of Jesus. Uh, there is a strict difference between veneration that is given to saints and to the righteous and worship that is given to God. Here, only God is being worshipped. He is the only one that is to be worshipped. And as a result, he is worshipped because of the judgment that has been rendered and the banquet that has not been prepared and we are called to partake of it. And we eagerly await, if you will, uh, to be a part of that heavenly banquet. Our life on earth is a pilgrimage. As we read many times in the Fathers of the Church and in the ascetic writings, and it is a pilgrimage preparing us for the life that is to come. And reassuring us of the glory and the beauty that will be a part of that life in its fullness. A new people, a new creation, seated around and being in the presence of God Himself. A supper where everyone equally partakes of and is nourished, and shares, and enjoys. Not like in Babylon, 
where the rich fared sumptuously and the poor starved and died. Or like in the Gospel, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man who feasted sumptuously every day, and the poor man, Lazarus, who willed to be fed from the crumbs that fell from his table. You see. Uh, it is a reversal, if you will, because of, of the judgment of God and, and, and uh, the mercy of God. We uh, are going to stop here, and uh, we will be back again, and we will continue in chapter uh, 19, uh, beginning in verse 11. And uh, we will uh, meet again on the 11th of June uh, because of the holiday next week and family day and other things that are happening uh, within the diocese. We will come back on the 11th and we will finish uh, in the month of June uh, the uh, book of Revelation and complete it. And uh, as I have said before, if any of you have any ideas of what you would like to see uh, studied as far as the books of Scripture, uh, please uh, send me uh, your requests and we will consider them. And, and uh, over the course of a summer break that we will take, after we complete this book, uh, we'll come up with uh, another book of the Scripture to study. And we will keep going on and on and on until we study the entire Bible, uh, God willing and our human ability to do. Uh, those of you who have any kind of questions, uh, you can uh, email me, uh, and I will do my best to be able to answer them. And we hope to see not only you, but we encourage you to bring your family and your friends and join us again on June 11th for another edition of our Orthodox uh, Bible Study Program. We thank you for coming, and we uh, ask God to bless all of you. Let us stand. And let us conclude with the hymn to the Holy Mother of God, especially in this particular time of year, the Paschal season. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. O shine, O shine, O new Jerusalem, for the Christ is risen. Indeed, he is. Christos was crescent. Christos on us. Christos on us.